Does home ownership change you? Is that a bad thing? Good afternoon. So every once in a while you'll see an article that uh, that's just not on the same planet as you are. Like, seriously. I just came across one of those from Vox today, and I wanted to go over it not to criticize, uh, not to criticize, more just to understand what someone might be thinking and uh, see if maybe there's some uh, points uh, that we can agree with or, or what. So let's get into it real quick. Um, it's right here, and I got to the, I'm sorry, I'm at the bottom, and let me get to the, the, uh, the, the title. It says, Home Ownership Can Bring Out the Worst in You. It's the biggest thing you might ever buy and it could be turning you into a bad person. So somehow, because you own a home, it makes you a bad person. That's the argument. So like the alternative is never own anything, which is a fear of some, the idea that you won't have any private property rights in the United States. That is a fear. So this plays right into that fear. Um, and so at first it talks about how people talk about how uh, it's been important to own a home. And finally, there's a, a quote, um, there's a, uh, basically there's a message that home ownership is a, a benefit and says, owning a home raises one in the estimation of his neighbors and associates. Nothing gives a man a better standing in a community than the fact that he is a householder, a payer of taxes on real estate. Now, that payer of taxes on real estate comes back uh, as a theme in the, in, the, in the article, okay? So let me just read some of the stuff that's, uh, that's kind of, I, f- I found interesting. It says, there aren't many other purchases that can for- confer this aura of civic duty. And it's worth examining the dark side of what happens to you when you become a homeowner. Home ownership, as it has evolved in the United States, often turns into its turns its beneficiaries against progress and change, manifesting as anything from opposing homeless shelters in your neighborhood to blocking transit process projects in your reason or in your region. This identity transcends partisanship and it's a rarity in our polarized age. So just this is what the person is writing. As it has evolved in the United States, the homeownership in other places apparently hasn't caused that. We don't really have anything to back that up. But, but anyway, a home is the largest asset the vast majority of Americans can ever own. Protecting its value is akin to protecting your family's future. Your ability to weather bad financial times, borrow if your kids need help paying for college, or rest easy knowing that in a country that you will leave you out to dry if you get sick, at least you'll be able to sell your house if it gets that bad. So we, we can see the author's... Um, biases shining straight through if we haven't before it's it's gotten to here and that's okay might as well be open about it than uh some sort of um say that you're not biased or that you somehow some sort of even a handed article this is this is not going to be that it says home ownership is supposed to mean security opportunity and a sense of investment in your community but often the pressure of tying your family's financial security to one asset incentivizes homeowners to behave selfishly and antisocially, opposing important public works that could provide significant public benefits. So it's a very interesting thing here, uh, the pressure of tying your family's financial security to one asset. So uh, the author, by default, would say we should tie our financial security to many different assets. And what would those assets be that would be as, as good performing or as well performing or as historically safe as home ownership. It says home ownership in the 21st century is home ownership under scarcity. And that's true. It says homes are scarce. One credible analysis found that the United States was short 3.8 million, 3.8 million homes as of the fourth quarter in 2020, leaving millions of Americans overcrowded in their current living situations, paying increasingly high rents and unable to find a starter home to break into the ownership game. So, I just, I mean, I can go along with it, kind of, but why are Americans overcrowded in their current living situations? Well, maybe because we've had increase in populations from different sources, um, paying increasingly high rents, which is why you would want to own a home and not have to continue paying increasingly high rents and unable to find a starter home. That's 100% right. But what are the reasons why we can't find starter homes? And in this article, do we use starter homes uh, as the same as we we use affordable housing? Because I don't know that they're the same. 
At one point near the end of 2020, researchers found that the country had just 1.9 months of supply and housing left. In simpler terms, if no new housing came on the market, the nation would have run out of homes to sell in under two months. And why is that? They go on to, the, the article goes on to describe NIMBYism, but NIMBYism in a way that um, is different than what you would normally think. It says, unlike many things, the value of a home is largely dependent on subjective evaluations of things outside the individual homeowner's control. This is 100% right. An individual can't control for school quality or the crime rate or whether home buyers will find their neighborhood aesthetically appealing. But all those things will affect how much they can sell their home for. And that's why the Deerwood Realty and Friends podcast is mainly about neighbors and mainly about how we navigate in this market where the, the rules don't seem to apply to everyone. Um, they seem subjective. Um, people behave in neighborhoods poorly and it does affect your property value. So that's 100% why. So we agree on something. So to hedge against the possibility that changes in the neighborhood could f harm the value of their largest assets, some homeowners will use whatever local lovers they have available to them to block change in their communities, whether it's new housing, homeless shelters, transit, or COVID-19 testing centers. This phenomenon is often referred to as nimbyism and often describes people opposing development or public projects in their area, particularly when they have no objection to the project when it exists somewhere else. And this is true. So one of the biggest ideas of nimbyism was when John Kerry uh, famously was against the wind projects uh, on Martha's, what was it, Martha's Vineyard out there in Boston, out there that way. Can't have those here, but you can have them everywhere else. So it happens across all political spectrums, which the author notes. Also, is it a bad thing that homeowners use whatever local levels they have available to them to block change in their communities? Uh, are they supposed to just rubber stamp everything that comes along? Stanford University researchers find that homeownership uh, increases participation in local elections. Is that a bad thing? And that asset investment may be an important mechanism for the participatory effects. That is, purchasing the home and seeking to protect its value may drive people to become more involved in local politics. Again, is people being involved in local politics a bad thing? Or is it just your politics? And when they do, they fight policies that would provide for affordable housing. Well, I'll, flat out, is affordable housing the same as starter homes? And what do you mean by affordable housing? That's where we get into these problems is we, we throw around terms and then we don't have really a good definition for them. Boston University researchers looked at planning board and zoning meetings in nearly 100 Massachusetts cities and town and found that meeting participants were disproportionately homeowners. Well, they have, again, as you've identified, a vested stake or interest in the community. Also, Massachusetts, not like the rest of the United States. Massachusetts is its own thing. It's just like saying California. If you go to California, they're going to think different than someone in the Midwest. So I don't know that that study is all that relevant uh, across the United States because we all have different views on how things should be uh, done. Participants also were more likely to oppose new housing in their communities than support it. Depends on the new housing. Now, I can remember I was in Gloucester, Massachusetts, and uh, I don't remember where we went, but we went somewhere, and the town didn't have a stop light. And they were going to put one in. And the town fought and fought and fought to, to, or the residents fought to keep this stop light from happening. Why? They wanted to preserve their traditional uh, community. Was it a bad thing? I don't know. Is it a good thing? I don't know. But I have no problem with people fighting for things that they believe in if they're residents of the community. It says, no one knows exactly who would be the direct beneficiary of a new home or a new bus line, but the people who might be annoyed by construction or have the value of their homes impacted are a distinct class. And that means they advocate and organize as a group in a way that the beneficiaries of these policies cannot. More common are the allusions to neighborhood character, which is an amorphous term, which the amorphous term is being used in this article many times. Uh, that could mean something very anodyne or sinister. As St. Paul, Minnesota City Council member told Rewire, people who use coded language like neighborhood character and historic preservation are participating in structural white supremacy that has historically and presently most valued white character and white history at the expense of everyone else. 
uh, so we don't have anything. We have nothing on that one. Uh, it is not that homeowners somehow have an exclusive claim on classism and racism. That's true. It's that the median homeowner is likely to be older and wealthier than the average U.S. resident. Older and wealthier people often have a preference for stability. They're closer to retirement and more likely facing medical needs as they are later in life. That means this group is predisposed to fear change even more than the average person, and they are overrepresented in our political system. How you can say that anyone is overrepresented in our political system by literally just, you know, exercising their rights to them, I mean, it's a stretch. None of this is meant to be an indictment of people who want to become homeowners. It kind of is. Kind of is. Basically, what you've said is the only people that buy houses are racists or people that oppose change or progress. And if you didn't do that beforehand, you will once you own a home. But it is a warning how it could affect your thinking in politics. Because while there is some rationality of the fears that drive homeowners to oppose growth and progress in their communities, there's also a massive cost. That's debatable. And the neighborhoods these homeowners are seeking to protect, perhaps their bet will pay off when they're ready to retire. They'll be sitting on a nest egg. But perhaps instead they will watch their kids grow up and leave, unable to afford rent. They may see community businesses struggle to support themselves as workers leave for other opportunities, unable to continue justifying living an hour away from their job and spending that entire time stuck in traffic. They may even find themselves unable to afford their rising property taxes after they've spent a lifetime paying down a mortgage. Well, let's just look at that one sentence. What happens when institutional investors come in and buy out a neighborhood and, you, and change it to all rentals? Okay. What do you think is going to happen in the property taxes? You know, this, what happens if you're just a nice person living in Kirkwood and you've lived there all your life and all of a sudden you get these McMansions around you and now your $200,000 house is going to be demolished literally for someone to build an $800,000 house. But that's, that's kind of the way life goes. Um, this whole paragraph, uh, instead they will, kids will watch their kids grow up and leave unable to afford rent. Well, maybe their kids are just going to get up and leave anyway. Maybe they don't like where they grew up. Maybe they want to grow up someplace else. Maybe their job will take their somewhere else. Uh, it's, it's, it's not about the community at that point. It's about an individual's free will. Uh, they may see community businesses struggle to support themselves as worker leaves for op other opportunities. Well, what if they leave for uh, government imposed policies that keep customers from coming into their, their, their businesses? I mean, you know, it's bizarre. Pro growth policies are what allow for economic ac opportunity. And we agree with that. And America's failure to provide a reasonable social safety net and its deference towards the interest of homeowners at the local level has undermined these policies at every turn. Well, that's your opinion. I don't agree. I don't agree. I agree with pro-growth growth policies. We just disagree what those are. So I had some thoughts. I had some questions I wanted to go over with you, but we're going to have to go quick because I don't have a lot of time. It says, is homeownership bad and how? That would have been the better title of the article. As it reads, we're somehow supposed to be upset that we will change with home ownership, but that's part of growing up, in my opinion. When you're 18 years old and you're renting an apartment or you're 20 years old and renting an apartment, you think a lot differently than when you actually buy a house and you start paying taxes and all of a sudden are stuck somewhere. Um, homeowners, it says, who pay the majority of taxes for education, public services, and tran transit may be opposed to new programs where the beneficiary is unclear. They may oppose bus lines, homeless shelters, which the author labels as progress and change. But does anyone think that the need for more homeless shelters and bus lines, et cetera, is progress? Uh, that is, shouldn't we want people to not be homeless and not have to depend on public transportation? I mean, don't we want people to have, have home ownership? Uh, it says, and then another quote is, home ownership is supposed to mean security, opportunity, and sense of investment in your community. But often, the pressure of tying your family's financial security to one asset incentivizes homeowners to behave selfishly and antisocially. So the argument here is that even though you pay property taxes and desire to maintain a, a certain standard of life that you literally pay for, you should instead be energized to spend more money on public works than yourself. Uh, could some public works be beneficial? Of course. But are all? No. So, I mean, we're just in, in disagreement. Um, one of the things is, is we're invested in our homes. It's our greatest asset. And when people might do harm to our home, we fight. People that don't get stuck paying property taxes and don't care if your property values go down often like to tell others what to do, but they own nothing. 
Um, and then one of the lines, one of the last things that I wanted to get to is it says in the in the article it says no one exactly, no one knows exactly who will be the direct beneficiary of a new home or a new bus line, but the people who might be annoyed by construction or have the value of their homes impacted are a distinct class. And that means they advocate and organize as a group in ways that the beneficiaries of these policies cannot. And I would just argue that the beneficiary of these policies have government paid charitable organizations that advocate on their behalf. Uh, they are professionals. And it's much more, they're much more so than homeowners. I mean, you want to talk about organized um, political groups. You look at the mass transit lobby, okay? Look at the affordable housing lobby. Look who's behind it. And then tell me that then tell me that some Joe homeowner has a chance against those people. So anyway, I wanted to bring it to you. Read the article. Tell me what you think. Am I, I mean, it's not am I right, but have you ever looked at home ownership as being a negative? I, it's not to me. It's not. This article um, misses the point, in my opinion. Uh, maybe I'm biased, though. Maybe it's because I'm a real estate agent. Um, but I can't tell you how much I enjoy being able to uh, show new home buyers, have them a first time home buyer buy a home in a community and to see kind of the relief and the happiness and the optimism and the promise of that purchase. I've also had to um, help people sell homes where the neighborhoods went, went to hell, went to absolute hell. Um, that ruins all the optimism that ruins all, everything. And, uh, some of those policies that they put, that people put forth, do end up damages, you know, do do end up dab, damaging neighborhoods and causing people to move out. So, whatever. I hope you uh, hope you enjoyed the uh, the the thought. The we have to always look at what other people are thinking. Um, it helps us. It helps us. Helps us grow as people. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And I'll catch you on the next one.